All right, you're very welcome along to the Crucible Theatre in Sheffield. Lovely view, in fact, over the Odeon. We've got the O2 Arena here as well. And uh, you might recognise the man beside me, but uh, he isn't currently wearing his white gloves, so I don't know if you will. But uh, I feel like saying, quiet, please, quiet, please. But that's that's your line. This is Leo Scully, and Leo is going to be refereeing the uh, World Snooker Championship final on Sunday and Monday. So uh, your first time doing it, Leo. I'm sure you're, you're quite excited this week. Really? I'm trying to control the nerves. Um, because between now and then we've still got a lot to do we've got the quarterfinals to do um, semi-finals to do so I'll be busy in the theatre um, between now and the final and then my family arrives on Saturday so that will really bring it home that the next day is going to be the big one From reading up on your life and career 19 years of age was it you were uh, recruited into the uh, yeah. police in Glasgow the East End so uh, how, how was that experience? I, I mean, starting off, I, I know obviously then in the 90s you led into your, your snooker career, but what was life as a police officer like and uh, how long were you there and what kind of experiences did you go through during that time of your life? Um, it, was, it was very interesting. Um, I was just, just a young man when I joined. Uh, I mean, now I, I can look back at 19-year-olds and think they look a lot younger. And I think, did that, was that how I looked at that age? Um, walking the streets of the East End of Glasgow. But it was a very different time then as well. 1977 I joined. Um, so there wasn't the same sort of prevalence of drug-related crime, which I think is there now. Um, but I suppose it, is, it was of its time. We dealt with other things. The, the thing that got us through was just walking the beat, speaking to people learning who they were, forming a relationship with the local people. And very often, they were the ones who would come to our help if we needed it. Um, so yeah, it was an interesting interesting time in my life. It strikes me that all the jobs that you've uh, done throughout your career, I know you were a taxi driver for a while as yeah. well, they all require a certain um, temperament and yes. uh, maybe a bit of patience as well. Is that fair to say? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I've said before that uh, this tongue can get you into an awful lot of trouble but it can also get you out of a lot of trouble so if you use it properly then instead of confrontation you can get cooperation um, and that's most of what I try to do. Where did the love of, of snooker start for you then? I know I'm reading up on, was it Baileyston uh, police yeah. station you were in yeah. in Glasgow and yeah, I've done your homework. a little bit a little <laughs> bit but uh, I guess playing snooker was possibly how you started. I read you had a high break of 93 I don't know if that's still yeah. your highest break or if yeah, you broke yeah. the century yeah. yet. No, 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 no. I've, it's a while since I've uh, played because now that I've got my specs on full time, if I try and play, I'm looking over the top and it's just... Um, but while I was in the police, the, the police have their own recreation association. So there's, there's some great footballers and golfers, snooker players within the force, but they can't take part in national or even local competitions because of the shift work. So many, many years ago before I was involved, there was this organisation formed um, and it's uh, Britain wide, UK wide and a friend of mine was organising an event and required officials and it's, it basically started from there, he said to me right, I know you play snooker, do you want to be a referee at this event? I said yeah of course I can do that, um, but he handed me a rule book, said no, one, yeah, one we're, of them, yeah, yeah. Book, it, it was a, an older version of that <laughs> but contained much of the same stuff. Um, and I actually had to set an exam and then when I was looking through the rules I realised do you know what, I don't actually know all the rules of this game that I've been playing and that's where it went, I sat my first exam and it just went from there and I was learning just about as quickly that I wasn't as good a snooker player as I thought I might be so the, the refereeing gradually took over There's been various incidents on tables and off tables of you know, Ronnie O'Sullivan walking off against Stephen Hendry in the yeah. UK Championship years ago Do you, do you recall many incidents that uh, you were officiating or uh, I know Ronnie had, had a photographer removed from one match yeah, you, were, yeah. you were refereeing but were there any bizarre or weird or uh, strange um, incidents while you were refereeing? There was a, a, well, a funny one on me I suppose during the UK Championship when we were in Telford some years ago I was refereeing a match between Ken Doherty and Ian McCulloch and the normal practice is after the first four frames the table fitter will come in and brush the table we'll set it all up while the players are away having a cup of tea then we would go and 
get a cup of tea or whatever and come back after the 15 minute break. But on this particular occasion, I was desperate to go to the loo and the table fitter hadn't come in. So I decided in my wisdom, I would go there first and then come back and here I've done the table and it'll be fine. So we deal with that and I go and get the players to go back on after the interval and we're walking out into the booth and open the curtain to walk in and the table's not set up because guess what, I forgot all about it. <laughs> and you can blame no one else for that one? Absolutely not. All I could do is apologise and set it up. But uh, they were both very good about it and, and saw the humorous side. Not at the time, I explained to them later why it happened. Were there, uh, I get, you started in the 90s, was it the refereeing snooker yeah. uh, on, on the professional circuit? But uh, was there a breakthrough moment or match for you where you, you were asked to referee maybe a, a certain big game where you, you realised that you were on a certain level of refereeing at that point? Um, yeah, I suppose I had joined uh, what was called the PRA, Professional Referees Association, in 89, 88, 89. And there was a two-year probation period during which time you're constantly assessed and if you're deemed um, suitable, you can then progress. And that was the route from amateur snooker or amateur refereeing to working with world snooker. And it was about that time, 2001 I think it was, I got the opportunity to referee on TV at the Regal Masters, which was the first event of the season back then. And it was it was a great match and to be involved and be on television, managing to, to cope with that match and get through it, you begin to think that, you know what, I could actually do this mm. all the time. Um, so it took a few more years of assessing and progressing because you, you don't just go straight in at the deep end. Um, so that, that might have been the time, you know, right about then. Your first final then, or it was a major final anyway, the China Open in, in 2011, would that yeah. be, uh, obviously, I think it was Trump beat Selby maybe 10-8 that, yeah, that, that yeah. year. But I think it was actually Trump's first ranking final. First ranking final. I think so. That was a strange one for you, and, and some people will be familiar with your story and your, and your health issues that you've had over yeah. the years. Um, what, what signs in China led to you realising that perhaps something wasn't quite right, right with your health? Well... Um, I was a smoker at the time and like a lot of smokers if we have a cold or a cough we, the last thing to go certainly after a cold would be the cough and I'd had a cold and I was coughing a lot in China and actually um, Jan Verhaas one of the senior referees happened to comment Leo you, you know, you're, you're coughing so much why don't you just give up smoking was what he said um, and about the same time and wish it we were Stephen Maguire happened to comment that he thought I'd lost an awful lot of weight. So those two things didn't immediately trigger anything, but during the same uh, event, I was, I was waking up through the night drenched in sweat, completely soaked, the bed covers were uh, soaked, and I happened to be wearing a red t-shirt one night, um, and the dye had come out of it. And it was as if, the, the only comparison I could really make would be if I'd gone into the shower, come out of the shower and just lay in the bed. That's how sweaty I was. Um, and that was a bit of a concern. And I began to feel really lethargic and, and horrible. So I had already decided that when I got home, I would go and see the doc, which is kind of unusual for me. My wife would tell you, you know, I'm, I'm the last one to take headache tablets or anything like that. So when I came home, I mean, she noticed right away and said, look, we need to get checked because she more than anyone had noticed the weight loss although Stephen had mentioned it I think because you get up every day and you look in the mirror and it's the same face you see you don't really maybe notice these changes so much um, and she'd really noticed the weight loss and it went from there I went to see the doctor a couple of days later and it hit the fan as they say I mean there'll be a lot of people watching this or listening to this interview who um, may be personally affected by cancer or someone in their family affected by cancer and I guess getting that news immediately uh, was it stage four lung cancer you were originally uh, diagnosed stage with three. stage three stage what, what small, was it small cell was it? sorry non-small cell lung cancer and what's that what's that immediate mo is it is it a type of moment where you're immediately 
thinking about your own mortality? Is it perhaps not? Is that overstating it a bit, or what's that original moment where you hear that news like? No, it's not overstating it. I think the first thing that happened was I went for an X-ray, and the result came back almost the next day, saying that there was a shadow in my lung and I needed further investigation. So I think even before I got the official diagnosis, I felt as though I knew. Um, smoker, lung cancer, we've all known about it, we all know it, it's not good for us um, and of course it's always going to happen to someone else but when you start to hear these things, so in my head I thought this isn't going to be good news. My wife on the other hand, she kept saying to me, um, maybe it's uh, pneumonia, is it pneumonia? I can't remember but when we went to the doctor and they finally decided you know, that he knew enough to be definite and said that it was cancer. She kept trying to convince him it was pneumonia or something else because I had just come back from China. I think she initially just didn't want to accept it. But strangely enough, I heard myself asking him at the time, and is it terminal? And where that came from, I've no idea. But it must have been in my head. Um, and maybe that was my first thought, as you say, uh, my own mortality. Because from then, I suppose you can somehow begin to start dealing with it. Because up until then, it's like, well, you don't know for definite. You've got these symptoms, you're getting these tests. Um, so, yeah, it's <clears throat> it's a pretty dark moment to be told that. Um, and then the medics are brilliant. They take over and they tell you how it's going to be and what's going to happen. And you're really in their hands. Um, and I owe them a huge debt of gratitude for what they did. During your um, <clears throat> your treatment, then uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but from reading up, a couple of chemotherapy sessions, yeah. thirty radiotherapy sessions. Yeah. I mean, what's what's that treatment like? Obviously, you're not refereeing at the moment. You're taking yeah. a you took a, a few years out of the game, but what's that like for you? I guess from your own personal point of view, physiologically, how does that affect you? And even I guess there must have been a toll as well on your your wife Joyce and, and your, yeah, your yeah. daughter Stephanie as well. Um, yeah, it has it's a huge effect. Um, chemotherapy is it's a horrible treatment to have to undergo, but when you consider the alternative, then what, what, what way are you going to go? Um, I was fortunate in that the combination of chemotherapy and radiotherapy being conducted at the same time was a new idea. And it... And my doctor's words had the, the tumour shrunk um, dramatically in his words. Um, so they were very pleased. After the second lot of chemo, I actually had a stroke. And I, my personal opinion was that there, there was some connection between the two. So that paused the radiotherapy just for about a week whilst that was dealt with. But I was very fortunate. Um, and, I mean didn't have any lasting effects from that but uh, it's quite a frightening thing Um, and I think again it might just be a personal point of view on it but I felt as though since I was the one receiving the treatment that somehow I had some kind of control probably didn't but because you were there you're the one that's been spoken to you're the one who's having to go through these things whereas my wife and daughter they're sitting out in a waiting room, well, occasionally they'd be allowed in um, with me for consultations, but by and large, they would be outside waiting and wondering and hoping and crying and, you know. So, a very difficult time for them. Um, and for anyone who's gone through it, you see yourself, a lot of your listeners will have personal experience. Um, but I suppose if I can do it, anybody can do it. Absolutely. I mean, <clears throat> what would you say to someone listening who... Perhaps there could be people watching or listening who smoked themselves. I know you said there you'd, you'd smoked since you were maybe 19 years yeah. of age. If there's people watching here who are perhaps trying to quit smoking or trying to cut back on smoking or people who maybe think, oh, lung cancer could never, yeah, it would yeah. never happen to me, it only happens to other people. What, what, what would you say to, to those people? Well, that, that first part or that last part that you mentioned is very true. We all think it's going to happen to someone else. Um, but obviously... It can happen to anybody. Um, I'm I'm certainly not going to preach to anybody about what they should or shouldn't do. Um, The doctors tell us that 
uh, smoking causes cancer or there's a direct link between smoking and cancer and they don't tell us that for no reason. So I think if, if anyone does want to consider it then go and speak to your local doctor, there's various clinics about and it's more and more publicised, I see it all the time now that there's local health advice for people who do want to stop smoking and I've over the course of my journey I've met loads of people who have tried to stop and failed and then tried again and failed and tried so I think it's a case of just keep trying if you're determined you're going to stop it then you'll stop it and for anyone who is currently in the situation that I've found myself in then just get up out your bed every day that's uh, people have said they have a positive mental attitude and uh, you need to be able to fight it but to be perfectly honest with you Shane I don't know what I did to fight it except I got out of my bed every day it's great advice um, you touched on it there and you mentioned the NHS and the great work that they do and you know in, in Ireland over the recent months there's been a bit of controversy around nurses strikes and, and, and nurses hours and pay and that sort of thing and it's a common theme I guess in many countries that yeah. nurses don't get the uh, the, the value or the credit that perhaps they deserve financially or uh, hours wise but what what would you say about the NHS and I guess in Scotland specifically in your case but uh, the work that they do and the work that um, healthcare workers do as well because obviously you experienced it first hand for, yeah. for years they, they are extraordinary people because um, what we hear on TV is usually the political arguments surrounding the funding of the NHS or various things like that um, types of treatment that are available but when you find yourself at the sharp end the the nursing staff and the doctors that carry out the treatment they they're worth their weight in gold they really are because they devote everything to the patients and what again we would forget is they've got a home life as well and we don't know what's going on in their life they might have other family members suffering with cancer or some other ailment but you would never know it when they're treating you um, I, just, I can't speak highly enough of them they're absolutely fantastic Did you think when you were undergoing um, all that treatment, and was it 2016 that you came back on the uh, the circuit? Yeah. Uh, I mean we're sitting here at the Crucible Theatre now, it's 2019 and you're days away from refereeing the, the biggest game of all it's the greatest honour in your profession um, every referee every snooker referee in the world wants to be where you are right now yeah. um, did you ever think that day would come? Had you aspirations of that from when you were years back starting out in refereeing or how did that come about in your mind? I think um, when I first started refereeing way back at that tournament that I mentioned I never thought in a million years that was just me helping out a friend by sitting a referees exam because he had a tournament to do um, but then once I joined the Professional Referees Association I was asked not long after I was involved in it what my aspiration would be and at the time I thought see if I could referee the crucible that would really be the pinnacle and then of course I got to referee the crucible so you start setting your sights a wee bit higher and then I got to referee I've refereed three semi-finals so once you've done that you think there could be a possibility um, but you, you never really know until you're told and then once you're told that's when the, the nerves came kick in, you need to try and keep the butterflies under control, but I'm really looking forward to it, it'll be a great day, or two days For anyone who watches snooker and uh, regularly watches the World Championships, they'll know that it's a, it's a two table setup, up, um, quite tight confined spaces up until the quarter finals yeah. and then at the semi-final stage it becomes the one table setup. up yeah. as you said there, you've refereed three World Championship semi-finals before, so you're used to the, uh, the one table setup. do you think that experience will stand you in good stead, or are you expecting something totally different on Sunday and Monday? I'm hoping that it will stand me in good stead because I'm expecting that when I go out on Sunday the the actual arena, the playing, the one table situation that will be the thing that's familiar. Um, you always get a fantastic reception from the, the audience at the Crucible um, and I've no doubt that Rob Walker or MC will um, encourage them shall we say um, so I'm quite, I'm quite sure there'll be a, a nice reception but once the players are announced and the, the match begins I'm hoping that thereafter I can concentrate enough to just treat it like any other match 
and then it'll be after it once it's all done I can sit back and tell people how wonderful I was. <laughs> <laughs> you can brag about it then. Uh, it's it's a funny profession because I, I guess on the Monday night the the, the final finish is late ordinarily, um, and then on the Tuesday morning everyone's looking at the newspaper headlines. Last year it was Mark Williams sitting yeah. half naked in his press yeah. conference. The year before it was Mark Selby after winning the second year in a row. Uh, I, I've seen you, and it's a quote I've written down here as well you've said this if someone is wondering who refereed the game the match afterwards and can't remember I've done my job well yes. so it's a funny it's a funny one in that the players want to be the one everyone's talking about on the yeah. Tuesday morning but you'd rather that nobody mentioned your name on the, on the Tuesday morning in some ways yeah because obviously the, the players want to be the one that everybody talks about because then they've they've achieved what they've set out to so and uh strange way maybe I would have achieved what I've set out to do if nobody remembers because it means that I haven't had to intervene I haven't had to um, be the centre of attraction or not attraction but the centre of anything that has in some way affected the game it's been done purely by the player who wins the most frames Um, and that's that's how we judge that we've had a successful match I've spoken to um, different players before last year at the Crucible I sat down with Ronnie O'Sullivan and, and Stephen Hendry separately and kind of asking them about the, the future of snooker and um, in some quarters the idea that the game is in decline fairly or unfairly um, that view is made but I guess people talk about young people nowadays not having the, the attention spans to, to watch or play a game of snooker. Um, as I said before, snooker halls are not cheap to rent. There it takes a lot of room to, to have five, six, seven snooker tables. So, it, uh, how do you think the state of snooker is right now? I know there's a lot more tournaments. Barry Hearn has uh, organised it. The prize money has gone up as well. Five hundred thousand pounds is the is the the uh, first prize for the winner this year at the Crucible. But what do you think of the the state of the sport right now? Um, I think certainly at professional level, Barry has done a magnificent job um, in providing opportunities for professional players to, to make a living from the game um, I'm not so much involved at amateur level anymore although back home in Glasgow myself and Anthony McGill along with uh, a club in Mount Florida we, we run a, a, a junior coaching academy and there's certainly if, if all the kids turned up on the same day we'd probably have 25 to 30 kids ranging from well, five, six, up until Rodis is now 16. Um, so the, I think the enthusiasm is there if we can provide the opportunities. But you rightly say to run a club isn't cheap and we're very, very fortunate with the club that where I, I'm involved that the, the owners have this interest and they use they've got a bar and the, you know so, so the adults pay and the club themselves subsidise the use of the kids uh, use of the facilities for the kids and I think that's spreading certainly back home but I know I mean it's usually popular in Ireland isn't it mm-hmm. you know, yeah I was in Dublin for the I think when it was it happened to coincide with St Patrick's Day it was the first PTC Grand Finals that was a great weekend well great week I can actually remember some of it, believe it or not. That was fantastic. Um, So, yeah, it's it's really big. Um, So, I think on a day-to-day basis, we we, we don't have so much awareness of what's going on. But when tournaments are announced, international events, uh, amateur level, European events, then these players all appear that you've maybe heard of who are previously professionals who have returned to the amateur ranks and they're still keen enough to play um, so yeah I think it, I think it's in a good place and it's huge in China and they've got academies in fact I'm sure it's actually part of the, the curriculum in schools in China that they have snooker lessons I wish they had that in my day <laughs> yeah, that certainly have helped the, um, you mentioned that China there as, as an example and I guess if, if the job of a snooker referee was to be advertised Hypothetically, in a in a local newspaper, the job spec people, if they were looking at it, I mean, one of the massive pros nowadays. We mentioned there that there's something like 30 tournaments in the professional circuit now. There used was six not that long ago. So, I'd imagine a lot of your job requires quite a bit of travel. Uh, where, what sort of places have you been recently? What sort of places um, 
would you like to get to visit uh, in, in your capacity as a snooker referee? I've been I've been in China several times. Um, it's such a huge country, um, and I find it fascinating. It's such a difference in culture, um, or different culture. I don't mean difference by way of comparison. Just that it's a different culture, and it's also quite a surreal moment. The first time I went to Beijing, myself and Michaela Tab. Um, Immediately, we arrived at the hotel, dropped our luggage off, and immediately got in a taxi and went to the Great Wall. And to be actually standing on the Great Wall of China is quite a surreal experience because you see it on TV and you know you've heard about it, you've read about it. To actually be there is amazing. Um, Australia is a fantastic place. We were in um, a place called Bendigo, which is about an hour and a half north of Melbourne. It was really nice. And India, I love Indian food anyway, but. <laughs> I was in, uh, I'm going to try and say the name of this place, Vishak Hapatnam, which is on the Bay of Bengal. I'm going to say, yeah, that was fine. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, and that was 20, what we were in, 19, 2017. And it was amazing, absolutely amazing. As busy as China, and uh, every bit is mad if you try and drive there. Um, but the food was out of this world. So, yeah, we've been very fortunate. Um, Riga in Latvia was lovely. I enjoyed that, we went there um, last year. So, yeah, I've been very fortunate in getting to travel to different places. I don't want to keep it too much longer, Leo, but uh, you mentioned there that Austra- being in places like Australia or China, standing on the Great Wall of China, quite surreal. Uh, talking about the Crucible Theatre for a second, and uh, I guess your first time here, in a per- both in a personal capacity and then as a, in a refereeing capacity. I, I spoke to um, Ken Doherty, of course, 1997 World Snooker Champion, uh, quite recently, and... He was talking about when he was a teenager coming here, winning a tournament, uh, a competition, and getting the chance to come and sit in the spectator seats and watching Steve Davis play and just finding the whole thing surreal from the seats. And then the next time he was there, he was sitting in the player seats, yeah. playing against Steve Davis, seeing his name in lights, thinking this is bizarre. And a total kind of a deer in headlights moment in some ways for a player when they first get here. But what's that like for you uh, when you first came to the Crucible, I guess, in both a personal and, and refereeing capacity? How did. Uh, how did that impact you? Well, the first time I was ever at the Crucible was just as a spectator, um, and it was 2005, the year Sean Murphy won. And my wife had arranged it as part of a birthday present because we'd never been to the Crucible. So I came down, um, and I was amazed at how small it was, how close the, the audience were to the, the tables. Um, and I thought, you know, it'd be really good to referee here one day. I didn't. I suppose I'd begun to think I could maybe do it, um, but that was that was the first time that I came, um, and then when I was here refereeing, the first time I was here was the year of the remember the Icelandic volcano or up there was the the ash cloud. Well, I was due to referee on the Monday, uh, Steve Davis against Mark King. But because Terry Camilleri and Jan Verhaas were delayed by the ash cloud, it meant that I was dropped right in at the deep end, so I was refereeing on the Saturday. And in a way, I think it probably stood me in good stead, because it, instead of me being me, instead of worrying for a weekend about what might go wrong, I was right in on the Saturday, um, and it was probably the best thing that happened to me. But you don't, speaking about Ken reflecting as a, like a deer in the, the, the headlights moment, I think for us... You need to be really careful of that because you will make mistakes, but we will all make mistakes. But you need to somehow be able to develop the ability to dismiss that mistake from your head as soon as you can. Otherwise, before you know it, you made another one. So for us, we maybe just got on with the job, and then once that match is finished, you can reflect on it and hopefully satisfy yourself that you've done it well. It's been a pleasure to talk to you, Leo. Um, very good with your time as well uh, I'm right in saying you're having quite a big year aside from the fact that you're a referee in the world snooker final you have a, a big marriage anniversary possibly and you have you have a health milestone coming up in uh, is it September or October as well yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'll be 30 years married in July congratulations thanks very much my wife keeps telling me she could have uh, been done for murder and get out but <laughs> um, I think she was just trying to beat me to that particular poor joke <laughs> Um, and then in um, the beginning of December would be five years till the end of my uh, treatment for cancer so I think at that point 
all being well between now and then, the doctors will just discharge me as a patient. Uh, and that'll be me. I don't know how that will, that'll, that might seem a bit strange because I've been going for checkups regularly, so it might seem a bit strange as long as I don't become paranoid and think there's something wrong with me. Listen, Leo, here's to 30 more years of marriage, many more years of good health, and uh, very best of luck on Thank Sunday you. and Monday. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Shane. Thank you.